Hello, Integrated Math One. Welcome. We're still on uh, module two, lesson, uh, topic one, lesson one. We're just doing the second half of it today. Um, but we're still in that same lesson trying to finish things off. Um, so in the previous activity, the last one we did in our last lesson before we ended it all, we determined that the constant difference or common difference of the chair height and the slope of the line were both equal to eight inches per chair. Um, so I guess the question we start asking ourselves is, um, is the slope of a linear function always equal to the constant difference of the corresponding arithmetic sequence. So it happened, we noticed last time that, hey, our constant difference or common difference was the same as the slope of the line of the function, but is that always true? So here's what we're gonna do. It may look a little weird, but we're gonna play with letters instead of numbers to see if we can prove that that's always true, that it always, always works. So to do that, we're on page M2-15. And I want you to consider this lovely graph here. I have an arithmetic sequence. You can see dot, 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 dot. And it's represented by the general linear function f of x equals ax plus b. And so I have my line that I drew through my lovely dots. And you'll notice when I plug in an n, I get out an answer of f of n. When I plug in an n plus 1, I get an answer of f of n plus 1, and so on and so forth. So what I'd like you to do is on the graph, can you identify the constant difference of the sequence? Go ahead and hit pause, draw on the graph where that constant difference is, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So we know that the constant difference should be the slope, right? Um, that the difference from this point to this point is that height between these two points. So I drew that in, I just put a little D in there. So every time I went over one, I went up D, right? That I go one more term and that constant difference was that height from the first term, from the one term to the next term. And it happened over and over again. Um, so here we've made a table for our consecutive values of the input. And this is what we were just saying, that if I plug in an n, I get an f of n, also known as a times n plus b. Because of course, um, in fact, let me write that down. Uh, if you're not sure where, there it is. If you're not sure where these numbers came from, it's because we have f of, um, hang on, ah, oh, no. <laughs> ah, technology. Um, it's because that we know that f of x equals a of x, um, a times x plus b. So I'm just saying that we're plugging things in. So if f of n, so if I plug in an n, I get f of n, we can see that on the graph, but that means I have a times n plus b. And of course, if we know if I plug in an n plus one, I get f of n plus one, but that means I'm doing a times n plus one plus b. Um, so hopefully you can see the pattern and what's going on here. It's just this just keeps changing. A and B stay the same every time. So I would like you to go ahead and hit pause, finish filling in the table, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So if I plug in an N plus 2, I get F of N plus 2, which means I'm going to plug it in here and I have A times N plus 2 plus B. If I plug in n plus 3 as an input, I get f of n plus 3 as an output, but that means instead of ax plus b, I have a times n plus 3 plus b. Yeah. Okay, okay. So here's what I would like to do. And this I know this gets messy because I have all these letters in here instead of numbers. I have all these variables. But again, I'm trying to show that this is going to work no matter what number is in there. That's the point here, that's the, that's the game that we're going for. So what I would like you to do is select any two consecutive input values in the sequence. So any two, can, any two that are next to each other, I really don't care which two you pick. And then I would like you to use these expressions for the term values to determine the constant difference of the sequence. So pick any two, any two um, consecutive ones. So these two, or these two, or these two from the table we just made, and I would like you to subtract the two of them 
and see what you get. I want you to see, find that constant difference. Remember how we did our first differences in the last lesson, subtract the these and these and these. I would like you to do the same. Just pick one set to subtract. Go ahead and hit pause and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So just because I wanted to keep things as simple as possible, I just picked these first two. And I am did this guy minus this guy. And it got a little messy. I'm not going to deny that. So I have this guy minus this guy. And I realized all oh, those parentheses, they needed to be distributed. They needed to be distributed. So I distributed um, these guys, A times N and A times 1. But I also distributed that negative sign that suddenly that's a negative AN and a negative B. So I just did all that distribution. If you don't see it, hang on, I'll show you a little better. Um, so I just did all that distribution. I just multiplied. Oh, why are we doing this? Multiplied, multiplied. And then I did it again here. Negative times a positive, negative times a positive, just to give me all those negatives. And then I noticed something. I had a positive AN and a negative AN, which means they're going to cancel each other out. Yep. AN minus AN. I got nothing. Um, I also noticed my Bs are going to cancel out because I have a positive B and a negative B. And B minus B is zero. They are also dead. And lo and behold, that means all I had left was A. But if you recall from our lovely function family, from the whole F of X, equals ax plus b, ooh, plus b, I lost my plus. You remember that a is your slope. So you just show that your constant difference is the slope, no matter what numbers I plug in there, it doesn't matter. It's always gonna give you a. So that's kind of nice, kind of snazzy. So recall that the slope of a line is constant between any two points on the line, not just consecutive points. We use the points next to each other, but I should be able to get the same slope no matter which points I pick. I could pick the first point and the last point, and I should still get the same slope. So real quick, just on the graph, can you just draw on the graph again? the slope of the function. Where is the slope on your graph? Go ahead and hit pause, draw it on the graph, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So I did that. And I know that slope is rise over run. So we already did, um, we said over one and up, uh, and up D, but now we know that D is actually equal to A. So I actually just put that D equals A on all of these. Because now we know that constant difference, that common difference, it's my slope A. Yes, it is. So describe how you can determine which quantity is independent and which quantity is dependent in any problem situation. So what I would now like you to do is I would like you to pick two. Oh, I made a mistake when I did mine. I'd like you to pick two, any two points. Last time we picked two consecutive points, um, but I would like you to pick two maybe that aren't consecutive and go ahead and determine the slope between those two points. Go ahead again, instead of remember last time we just picked the two next to each other, don't do that. Pick two that aren't next to each other and take it a little further. Go ahead and hit pause to work it out and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. All right, so how to do, did you pick two points that weren't next to each other to do the subtraction? And I'm actually gonna do the full on slope. Remember to do slope, remember I told you to memorize that formula last lesson, how you do your output, dip, your subtract your output on top and you subtract your input on the bottom. So that's what I did. So I picked two points that weren't next to each other. So I picked um, this guy here and this guy here. But it also means that on the bottom, I had to subtract n plus 2 and n. Yeah. So now I had to subtract stuff on the bottom because I didn't pick the guys next to each other because I had two guys that weren't next to each other. I had a little extra special bonus here. And this might help fix up some issues you may have been having while you work these out. So just like last time, 
I'm going to distribute. So A times N, A times 2, negative times this guy, negative times that guy. And I don't need to distribute those, but I can drop the parentheses. Yay. So that means I have AN plus 2A plus B minus AN minus B, because I distributed that negative sign, and I didn't need those parentheses there. So I just have N plus 2 minus N. And hopefully you're noticing that there are things I can now cancel. I have an AN minus AN. Those are going to die. I have B minus B. Those are going to die, just like last time. Ooh, look, I have stuff that cancels on the bottom now, too. N minus N. Those guys are going to cancel out and die as well. So I'm actually left with 2A over 2. But that simplifies, right? 2A divided by 2 is just plain Jane A. So even though we didn't pick two consecutive points, even though we picked two points that were not next to each other, I still got a common difference, got a slope of A. That did not change. It's all the same stuff. Yeah, my slope is constant. My slope is constant. But we knew that was going to happen, didn't we? We knew that was going to happen. Yeah. So here's the deal. The slope A is equal to the constant difference. We've already established this. My common difference in my arithmetic guys is the same thing as my slope in my linear functions. So another name for the slope of a linear function is what we call an average rate of change. And so you have a formula that looks like this guy right here. So this represents the change in the output as the input changes, all right? So this is how my output changes compared to my input. It's a ratio, the ratio of my difference in my output to the difference in my input. But this looks like a weird slope formula, right? Because that's not the one you're used to. You're used to, so this is our new guy, our whole f of s minus f of t, our average rate of change over s minus t. Sorry for the sloppy handwriting. But you guys are used to seeing it like this, y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. That's how you're used to seeing it. So I would like you to just take a moment and just show that the slope formula and this average rate of change formula, they represent the same ratio. Can you just take a moment to jot down how they represent the same thing? Go ahead and hit pause, jot through down your thoughts, and hit play when you're ready to continue the discussion. So um, we said that the average rate of change is representing that ratio of the change in our output to the change in our input. Um, but isn't that what this is doing as well? I mean, we say it differently. This slope formula represents the ratio of the change in our dependent quantities to the change in our independent quantities. But it's doing the same exact. These formulas totally represent the same ratio. We just have a million different words for it. Common difference, slope, average rate of change. They all mean the same thing. That's important to know. That's important to know. Because if somebody asks you for the average rate of change, you might freak out until you realize, oh, they just want the slope. Oh, they just want the common difference. That's all they want. So keep that in mind. It's good information to know, isn't it? So here's the deal. Now that you're sick of all the variables and you're like, I want real numbers because that was awful. Let's come back to the remaining explicit formulas and graphs from activity one because we really focused in on graph C and his formula. But let's look at the other three at graphs A, B and D and the formulas that went with them. So let's just take a few moments, just real quick, for each graph and arithmetic sequence. Start off, just identify that constant difference in the explicit formula and on the graph. So what's our constant difference? What is it in the formula? What is it on the graph? Hit pause, then go uh, to <laughs> hit pause to work it out. Hit play when you're ready to check your work. So I was naughty, I didn't quite write it on the graph, but I did write it down. So for this first one, graph A, I can see that my constant difference is a negative four. And you can see I go down four over one, down four over one, down four over one. Yeah. 
For graph B, my constant difference is a positive 2. And sure enough, my slope goes up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1. I know it looks weird because of the way they drew it, but trust me, we're good. Check the numbers. And for graph D, I can see my constant difference is also a positive 2. And sure enough, up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1. And I know it looks weird, but you can see it's up 2 and over 1. Sorry that the graph looks funky. So now what I'd like you to do is for each of those explicit formulas, I would like you to rewrite each explicit formula in function notation. You may need to flip back to the lesson from last time to remember how to do that, but go ahead and do that. Go ahead and hit pause, do it for all three of these, put your explicit formulas in function notation, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So um, I did each one. So for graph A, I had this lovely formula. I distributed my negative 4. Negative 4 times n is negative 4n. Negative 4 times negative 1 is a positive 4. Ooh, and I'm going to put my negative 4n up the front, and then 2 plus 4 gives me 6. Yay. And now I have f of n instead of a sub n. For graph B, I needed to change my a sub n to an f of n, and I needed to distribute that too. So 2 times n is 2n. 2 times a negative 1 is negative 2. I'm going to put my 2n up the front, and then negative 4 plus a negative 2 gives me a negative 6. And last but not least, graph D. I'm going to change my a sub n into an f, and f of n. Got it. Um, I'm going to distribute that too. So 2 times n is 2n. 2 times a negative 1 is negative 2. I'm going to put my 2n up the front and then put my 4 and my minus 2 together. Ooh, 4 minus 2. That is 2. Yay. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And so real quick, just verify that the constant difference is the same as the slope of the linear function. So now that you've got all your linear functions, just notice, uh, take a look at what the slope is and make sure that it matches your constant difference from before. So hit pause to try that out. Hit play when you're ready to check your work. I may have done it a little differently than what you did, but that's okay. So when I did it, I said, okay, well, I'm going to subtract the y values of any two points. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to take f of 1 minus f of 0, and I subtracted them. And that's what I got. So uh, if I subtract them, sure enough, I find out that my slope is negative 4. I did the same thing for b. I subtract my first term minus my y-intercept. Um, so I subtracted my first term, which is negative 4, but when I looked at my function, my y-intercept was a negative 6, and so when I subtracted those, I got a positive 2. My slope is 2. Same thing with graph C. I said, all right, well, my first term is 4, but when I look at my function form, my y-intercept was uh, 2, so 4 minus 2 gives me my slope, which is 2. It's not the only way to do it. You probably did it a better way. To be fair, but it works. It works. Uh, I would now like you to just, can you just describe to me real quick how the first term in the explicit form is related to the y-intercept of the function? We know they're not the same, but there is a relationship between your first term in your explicit form and the y-intercept. Even though they're not the same, how would you get between one and the other? Go ahead and hit pause to give that some and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So I, I played with this a bit and I thought, you know, the first term would be f of one in my function, but the y-intercept is f of zero. And that means in order to get to my y-intercept, I would have to subtract my common difference, wouldn't I? So I realized that if I had my first term, I could subtract my common difference d and find my y-intercept, my f of 0. So yeah, so for graph a, I could do 2 minus my common difference was negative 4. And that would give me my y-intercept of 6. I found that if I took my 
first term on graph B, which was a negative 4. And if I subtracted my common difference of 2, that would give me a negative 6. Yay! And it, sure enough, that's where it should hit my y-axis. For C, I did the same thing. And I said, okay, the first term was, uh, pardon me, D, not C. My first term was 4. So I'm going to subtract my common difference of 2. And that tells me, well, my y-intercept should be 2. And sure enough, if I kept that line going, you could see it would hit my y-axis at 2. Mm -hmm. All right, are you sick of that mess? Good, let's do something new. Um, Kenyatta's cat loves to knock over flower pots. <laughs> Each morning, she counts the number of flower pots her cat knocked over the night before, uh, right before she ups right, uprights them again. So sequence C that we have down here represents the number of flower pots knocked over on day one, day two, day three, and on and on and on and on. So first day she knocked over three flower pots. The next day the cat again knocked over three flower pots and again and again and again. How are those flowers surviving? It's not good. Um, so what I would like you to do is take a look at your sequence. I would like you to determine the constant difference of your sequence and write an explicit formula. Just like we did in the last unit, write an explicit formula for me for, to represent this sequence. And then once you've done that, put your terms into a table of values. We've done that a million times before. And then graph the table of values. Go ahead and hit pause and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. All right, so I was like, well, my common difference is zero. <laughs> and my first term is three, so I put in a three uh, plus zero times n minus one. And then I was like, well, this is silly because zero times anything is zero. So this whole chunk, because zero times anything is zero, this whole chunk is like gonna die. So it turns out I just have a sub n equals three. Fair enough. I then put my terms in here. So terms uh, one, two, three, four, five. So I put one, two, three, four, five for my term number, but all of my terms were three. So that was not as exciting as I hoped. And that also means when I graphed it, it did something a little weird because if I went over one and up three, over two, up three, over three, up three, and it looked like this. It is a line, right? I mean, it's definitely linear. That's definitely linear. Okay, okay. We, we expected that, anticipated that. Can you use function notation to rewrite your equation representing that relationship between the number of days x and the number of new flower pots c? Um, so basically take your explicit formula and just rewrite it in function notation. Go ahead and hit pause to work that out and hit play when you're ready to check your work. So I replaced my a sub n and I didn't use f of x because they did ask me to use a c instead of an f. So instead of f of x, I use c of x. So I just replaced my a sub n with c of x and then I was done because there is nothing to work out. There's nothing to distribute. There's nothing, there's nothing, nowhere to go. Um, and so this tells me a few things. First of all, this is a constant function. Notice there's no slope. There is no slope. My slope is zero. That's right. My slope is zero and my y-intercept is three. So that wasn't as exciting as I thought it would be, but that's okay. I would like you to prove that the slope of c of x is equal to the common difference of sequence c. Go ahead and hit pause, jot down your thoughts on this, and then hit play when you're ready to keep the discussion going. So the ratio of the change in our output to the change in our input is zero between any two ordered pairs that you pick it doesn't matter it doesn't matter we're just pointing out that our rate of change is zero yeah that's more complicated than it needed to be possibly 
All right, I got another one. Here, I've got a similar sequence for you. I would like you, now that you've seen the sequence from earlier and how we wrote our function, I would like you to write the function d of x to model this sequence. Go ahead and hit pause to write it down. Hit play when you're ready to check your work. So again, I'm noticing that my lovely, lovely little function here um, has a slope of zero. <laughs> it has a slope of zero. Again, there's no constant difference. My constant difference is zero. It's never changing. So I just wrote d of x equals negative five. Um, can you prove to me that it's a constant function? I may have already given it away. Go ahead and hit pause, jot down why it's a constant function, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So uh, yeah, it's a constant function. Why? Because my slope is zero. There's no slope. Slope is zero. Mm. Keeps it simple, I suppose. Um, and the values of the dependent variable just remain constant over the entire domain. Sure enough. All right, just a few last little things. So you've proven that all arithmetic sequences can be represented by linear functions. It was messy and it got a little ugly, but we got there. We got there and that's what matters. So here I have a lovely graphic organizer for you here on page M2-20. And so we're just gonna fill in, complete this graphic organizer to kind of summarize the connections between our arithmetic sequences and our linear functions. And just describe how you can tell linear function exists given a table of values or a graph. So I filled in my lovely table here. Um, I know that my first term is my out and uh, f of x, or pardon me, a sub n, I should say, is the same as f of x, and that's my output. I know that my common difference d is the same as a on my linear function, that that's the slope. I know that I input n when it's a sequence, but my input is x when I'm dealing with a linear function, so that's my input value. And of course, I know that b is my y-intercept on a function, but to do that with a linear sequence, with an arithmetic sequence, I had to do my first term minus my common difference to get my y-intercept. So on a table, the best way to look for that is to is look at those first differences. That on a table, the first differences will be the same in a linear relationship, and that on a graph, the linear relationship will create a straight line. Whoo, that felt kind of heavy. That felt kind of heavy. As always, though, I hope you found it at least a little helpful and a little useful. <laughs> If you have questions or concerns, email me or come see me during office hours, and I will see you soon. Bye.